Human sacrifice, an unpleasant but fundamental aspect of Aztec culture, deeply intertwined with the religious beliefs and rituals, primarily to nourish the gods and ensure the continuation of the world and its natural processes. Centered in Tenochtitlan from the 14th to the 16th centuries, these ritual sacrifices often involved the removal of hearts from war captives or slaves offered to a sun god to sustain his strength against darkness and to a rain god to guarantee agricultural prosperity. Conducted during elaborate ceremonies on grand pyramids, these acts not only served as religious purposes, but also reinforced the social hierarchy by emphasizing the power of the elite and priesthood, while instilling a mix of fear, but also respect, among the populous and subjugated tribes. Such practices were crucial to ensure the Aztec Empire's ideology and societal structures, until the conquests of the Spanish disrupted their civilization in the early 16th century. Hello and welcome to the channel. If it's your first time here, good to meet you. And if you're coming back, great to see you again. As always, if you want to support the channel, a like and subscribe always helps. And if you want to go above and beyond, check the video description. But for now, let's all get nice and relaxed. And we can explore the topic for today. Albeit it's a rather macabre one. Now, first of all, I would like to say that most of our information does come from European sources, and I will be talking about how this can become a little bit of an issue later on in the video. But, before anyone comments first about that, I just want to get that out of the way. But we are going to open with a kind of a scene of confrontation, between an Aztec priest and a Spanish conquistador. You see, when the Spanish had arrived and observed what was no doubt quite horrifying to them, they insisted that the Aztecs immediately cease from these activities of human sacrifice, to which an Aztec priest had reportedly responded to them as a kind of justification. He said, Life is because of the gods. With their sacrifice, they gave us life. They produce our sustenance, which nourishes life. The Aztec priest's defense of the practice of human sacrifice shows this spiritual rationale underpinning the gruesome practice. You see, to the Aztecs, the cosmos itself was upheld by the gods' continuous self-sacrifice. According to their cosmological narrative, as recorded in the Legend of the Five Suns, each era of the universe, or sun, was created and destroyed through the gods' sacrifices, and humanity's existence in the current era was only made possible by these divine acts. The concept of next la huale, or debt payment, was integral to the Aztec spirituality. It encapsulated the belief that humans were eternally indebted to their gods for their very existence and sustenance. All the crops that grew, every drop of rain that fell, and the cycles of life and death were all seen as blessings from the gods that required, of course, reciprocal offerings. The ultimate expression of this indebtedness, of course, was the sacrifice of a human being, viewed not merely as a ritualistic offering, but as a necessary act of cosmic responsibility. Victims were often portrayed as noble participants in a very sacred ritual, willingly paying the debts of humanity to ensure the continuation of the world. 
Such beliefs were deeply embedded within the very architecture of Aztec society, with the grand temple pyramids serving as both ritual centers and monumental offerings to the gods. These pyramids adorned with treasures, art, and the remnants of sacrificial victims were not merely religious buildings, but were themselves an offering dedicated to the gods that were buried beneath them. Thus the confrontation between the Franciscans and the Aztec priesthood after the Spanish conquests reveals this dramatic clash of world views. The Franciscans, armed with Christian doctrine that abhorred human sacrifice, could not reconcile their beliefs with the Aztecs' view that such sacrifices were vital to the sustenance of life of the cosmos. It was just a bridge too far. You can see in other cultures of the world, for example, when Christian missionaries at first went to China, there were practices in Taoism and Confucianism that seemed somewhat secular, things that could be reconciled, didn't view them as so monstrous and beastly. But going and seeing what they saw, those bodies tumbling down those pyramids, well, that was just a little bit too much for the European sensibilities. Thus this profound misunderstanding and the ensuing cultural and religious imposition highlight this tragic consequences of two radically different belief systems colliding. Only one was going to make it. There was no room for compromises. Thus the multifaceted nature of sacrifice in Aztec society encompassed not only the well-documented human sacrifices, but also extended to animals and even self-inflicted offerings, showing a profound reverence for and dependency on sacrificial rituals. Animals like dogs, eagles, jaguars, and deer were specifically bred for sacrifices, reflecting the importance of these rituals in maintaining the balance and sanctity of the natural world as perceived by the Aztec spiritual elite. These practices were integrally linked to various deities and their associated cults, each demanding a different form of life to sustain the gods' favor and vitality, a delicate balance, and each god required something different. For example, the cult of Quetzalcoatl, the feathered serpent, was unique in its requirement for the delicate sacrifice of butterflies and hummingbirds, animals associated with beauty, gentleness, and precision within nature. Now self-sacrifice, involving the offering of one's own blood, was equally significant and pervasive across the strata of Aztec society. This form of sacrifice was deeply personal and was often performed as an act of penance or devotion, embodying a physical connection between the divine and the mortal. The Florentine Codex provides a detailed account of these rituals, including the dramatic imagery of gods like Quetzalcoatl mutilating themselves to sustain or even create new life. This mythic narrative underscores the ideology that divine blood was potent and life-giving, a belief mirrored by the actions of the people themselves, who would pierce their tongues, earlobes, and other parts of the body to offer their blood to the gods. The theory proposing human sacrifice as a nutritional substitute due to the scarcity of large game is controversial, but it does highlight the complexities of understanding Aztec sacrificial practices within their environmental and economic contexts. This is a perspective that is 
not widely accepted. But it does prompt a broader examination of the practical implications of ritual sacrifices, going beyond simply religious or cosmological significance. Debates among scholars about whether these rites served as atonement reflect a broader discourse on the topic. While some view these acts as a means to sustain and assist the gods in their celestial duties, others suggest they served as a form of proprietation or penance, intended to correct spiritual or physical imbalances caused by sin or insult as perceived by the Aztecs. Extreme self-punishments for sins, such as hanging or self-defenestration, which basically means to throw yourself off a building, or out of a window if we're going by the typical French, were indeed documented, though the specifics of such practices are sometimes obscure due to gaps in the historical record. Now, the Aztec sacrificial rituals were of course deeply embedded in the cultural and religious fabric of the society, and they served as a vivid demonstration to their very complex cosmological beliefs and the central role that sacrifices played within them. Each ceremony was thus meticulously planned and executed, no pun intended, often during specific months or significant festivals, and always with a prescribed number of victims and accompanying offerings, which underscored the ritual's importance both to the community and the cosmos. Everybody would get together to watch the sacrifice, kind of like how you get together to watch the cricket. Now, victims were selected based on criteria that match the religious requirements of the deity being honoured. This often included warriors captured in battle who were deemed worthy to be offered to the gods. These individuals were not merely passive participants, but were integrated into the community in the days leading up to the sacrifice. They assumed the persona of specific deities, performing duties that ranged from blessing children to engaging in public dialogues and leading sacred processions. This integration was, of course, dual-purposed. It not only honoured the deity, but also reinforced the sacrificial role as a prestigious affair, albeit fatal, but one that is still in service to the divine order, all for the greater good and a great honour. Now, on the day of the sacrifice, the ritual was a communal event, involving multiple priests, and often witnessed by the larger community. The victim, if we can say that terminology, embodying a god, was led up to the steps of the Great Pyramid to the summit, where the temples and the sacrificial altar, or chakmol in their language, were located. The ascent was symbolic, representing a return to the celestial realm. The chakmol itself, positioned at the top of the pyramid, was not merely a stone slab, but it was a sacred effigy that facilitated the communication between the Aztecs and their gods. Laid upon this altar, the victim was held down by four priests, emphasizing the seriousness and solemnity of the moment. It was the high priest, wielding a flint knife, a material chosen for its purity and sharpness, would then perform the heart extraction. This was believed to release the life force, or the tona, which was considered a vital offering to the gods. The extracted heart was believed to nourish the gods and sustain the balance of the cosmos particularly the sun, and according to Aztec belief, the sun was powered by the hearts of sacrificed warriors. Thus, their ritual killings were seen as essential to the continuation of the world, 
kind of like putting petrol in the car, throwing some coal into the furnace. The car needs petrol, the furnace needs coal, and the sun needs sacrificed warrior hearts. Well, after the heart was removed and offered to the gods, the body of the sacrifice was thrown from the pyramid's summit to a terrace below, signifying the completion of the transformation from earthly being to divine offering. Thus it was all seen as essential to the continuation of the world. If it stopped, well, the world would stop too. I suppose they'd been doing it for so long that, well, even if they thought about stopping to do it, they were just too frightened of what would happen. Of course, the rituals surrounding the human sacrifices were not only varied, but they were deeply symbolic, driven by a range of divine allegiances and cosmological narrative. Each method of sacrifice was carefully chosen to align with the attributes and myths associated with specific deities, and it wasn't always the main event of cutting the hearts out and throwing them down the stairs. You see, in the bustling ceremonial centre, the air filled with the sounds of hymns and the rhythmic beats of drums, the community engaged in collective rituals of self-sacrifice. Priests and laypersons alike participated in auto-sacrificial acts, using sharp instruments to draw their own blood in a show of devotion and shared suffering with the sacrificial victims. This practice is what's believed to strengthen the spiritual potency of the ceremony and forge a deeper connection with the divine. Following the execution of the sacrifice, the ritualistic display continued with the treatment of the remains, which varied depending on the specific rites being performed. Typically, the viscera might be offered to the animals kept within the sacred zoo, a practice that symbolically linked the wild and divine aspects of nature. The severed head of the victim was prominently displayed on a skull rack that stood as a grim testament to the scale of sacrifice performed, and served as a powerful symbol of life, death, and rebirth. In cases where cannibalism was involved, the ritual distribution of the victim's body followed strict social and religious guidelines. The warrior responsible for capturing the victim was awarded the limbs, which were considered less spiritually significant. In contrast, the core of the body, the stomach and the chest, was reserved as an offering for the gods, reinforcing the hierarchy within both the human and divine realms. Different gods demanded unique forms of sacrifice. Victims might be shot with arrows to honor a god associated with warfare and hunting. Others might face death in ritual gladiatorial combat, or through the ceremonial ball game, which combined elements of sport, battle and sacrifice into a single highly charged event. Some were burned, some were flayed, some were drowned each method reflecting the mythic attributes of the specific deity they wanted to please. And of course, not all who were chosen for sacrifice were keen to accept their fate passively. The conquistadors Hernán Cortés and Pedro del Alvarado noted instances where captives deeply ingrained with the religious significance of their impending sacrifice, refused offers of freedom. To these individuals, the act of sacrifice was a destined honor, a final sacrifice to their gods promised to a revered place in the afterlife. But of course, not all had this attitude. 
Some were the captured warriors, the prisoners, and I suppose religious convictions or not. Nobody wants to have their heart ripped from their chest. It seems to be a common human trait that transcends cultures. Well, the accounts of human sacrifice during the reconsecration of the Great Pyramid of Tenochtitlan in 1487 present vastly different figures, reflecting a complexity of historical evidence along with its interpretation, but also potential biases of those who recorded these events. Now, there are a wide range, between 10,000 and 80,000, as possible victims that suffered over a mere four-day ceremony during that reconsecration in 1487. But it does suggest a logistical improbability at the higher end of this range. It would require an average of 15 sacrifices per minute to achieve such a number, a feat that, quite honestly, stretches the bounds of practicality. Further complicating the historical record are the accounts from the Codex Teleriano Remensis, which, based on discussions with older Aztecs, cites approximately 4,000 victims, which is of course a stark contrast to other figures. Now this discrepancy raises questions about the motivations of different sources. Spanish accounts, like those from Bernal Diaz, may exaggerate numbers to underscore the perceived barbarity and justify the conquest of the Aztec Empire. But, even if it's 4,000, that's still 4,000 too many human sacrifices. Far be it for me to push my morality onto others. But in contrast, Aztec records might inflate numbers of their own to display power and, of course, instill fear in rivals. The discussion continues with Michael Harner's reference to Bora, suggesting as many as 250,000 annual sacrifices in central Mexico during the 15th century which would account for about 1% of the estimated population. Now this figure, alongside other claims that one in five children of Mexico subjects was annually sacrificed, seems pretty improbable, and has led some scholars to propose lower, but still significant numbers such as 20,000 per annum. Now, in terms of archaeological evidence, while invaluable, also presents limitations in confirming these historical accounts. For instance, the discovery by Raúl Barrera Rodríguez of extensive remains near the Templo Mayor complex suggests a significant scale of human sacrifice. Yet the physical evidence, as if 603 skulls, found at least as of 2020, does not conclusively support the highest estimates. Thus these varying archaeological accounts reflect not only the methodological challenges of historical and archaeological scholarship, but also the potential use of exaggeration as a tool by both the Aztecs and the Spanish conquerors. Of course, each group had motives for manipulating the narrative. The Aztecs might have sought to emphasize their power and divine favor, while the Spaniards likely aimed to justify their colonial and religious goals. Every Aztec male was trained as a warrior from a young age, but only those who succeeded in capturing enemies were considered for elevation to that elite warrior class. This requirement shows the significant role that military skill and the ability to provide sacrificial victims played in their society. Collaboration among young warriors to capture a single prisoner points to the challenging nature of this task. The practice not only increased the chances of success for an individual warrior, 
but also fostered a sense of teamwork and strategic planning within the military structure. Regarding the victims of these sacrifices, there is a notable diversity in their social backgrounds. While it might be assumed that the victims were primarily commoners or foreigners, viewed as more disposable, historical records do suggest a more nuanced picture. Slaves, often used as sacrificial victims, did not belong to any distinct or permanent social class. They could be individuals from any level of society who had fallen into debt, committed crimes, or were captured in war. This fluidity in the status of slaves challenges the notion of a rigidly stratified society in terms of sacrificial eligibility. And then, of course, there is the prisoners of war, who constituted a significant portion of the victims, coming from various social strata, and that included the nobility. Notably, children of noble lineage were also sacrificed, often offered up to the sacrificial plate by their own parents. On the discovery of a skull rack, also called a zompantli, at the Templo Mayor in 2015 provides physical evidence that women and children were also included among the victims, further showing the non-discriminatory nature of Aztec sacrificial practices. Interestingly, in 1454, an Aztec edict prohibited the sacrifice of captives from distant lands in the capital's temples, suggesting a shift towards using individuals who were friends of the royal house, a euphemism for warriors from allied states. This directive might have been influenced by political considerations, aiming to maintain and strengthen alliances with neighboring states rather than alienate them through the sacrifice of their citizens, which of course tends to leave a poor taste in people's mouths. Now, visual depictions of Aztec sacrificial practices are predominantly sourced from the codexes crafted during the 16th century, often under patronage of the Spanish colonizers. This influence suggests that these illustrations may carry European biases, reflecting more about the Spanish perception and interpretations of Aztec culture rather than the Aztecs' own viewpoints. Among these, the Codex Urios, Codex Tudela, and Codex Maglia Becchiano are paramount among the main sources that we have left. These documents vary in their detail and perspective, but they collectively offer a rich visual narrative of Aztec religious life. But in contrast, surviving Aztec statuary provides a more indigenous perspective on sacrificial rites. These artifacts often focus on the mythological and theological underpinnings of sacrifice, rather than on the concepts such as debt repayment. A notable example of this is the Coyolhuaki stone, which depicts the dismembered body of Coyolhuaki and serves a dual purpose. Mythologically, it commemorates the victory over Coyolhuaki and her allies, underscoring the cosmic justification for human sacrifice. But politically, it was strategically placed at the Templo Mayor to symbolize the fate of those who would oppose the Aztec state, thereby reinforcing the state's military and divine authority. Now, the first-hand accounts of the Spanish conquerors, including those of Juan de Grijalva, Hernán Cortés, and Bernal Díaz, provide additional descriptions of Aztec sacrifices. However, it's important to remember that these accounts were often colored by the author's motivations to justify the conquest and colonization of the Aztec Empire by simply depicting its people as barbaric, and in sore need of salvation and governance. 
This portrayal does raise questions about the reliability of their descriptions. Other historical sources, such as the writings of Bartholomew de las Casas and Sahagun, who had direct interactions with indigenous people, offer potentially more balanced perspectives. La Casas, in particular, is noted for his defense of native rights in criticism of Spanish colonial practices. Sahagun, through his extensive work with native informants, compiled detailed ethnographic accounts that remain critical to understanding Aztec society. Juan de Grijalva, a key figure in the early Spanish exploration of Mexico, embarked on his expedition in 1518. He was accompanied by Juan Diaz, among others. Diaz, a chronicler of the expedition, later authored the work The Itinerary of Grijalva, a document composed before 1520 that provides a detailed observations from their journey. In this account, Diaz vividly describes encountering the aftermath of an Aztec sacrificial ritual on an island off the coast of Veracruz, and it reads as follows. This is from his writings. When we reached said tower, the captain asked him why such deeds were committed there, and the Indian answered that it was done as a kind of sacrifice, and gave to understand that the victims were beheaded on the wide stone, that the blood was poured into the bays, and the heart was taken out of the breast and burned and offered to said idol. The fleshy parts of the arms and legs were cut off and eaten. This was done to the enemies with whom they were with at war. Another account by Bernal Diaz adds to Juan's depiction. It goes like this. On these altars were idols with evil-looking bodies, and that every night five Indians had been sacrificed before them. Their chests had been cut open, and their arms and thighs had been removed. The walls were covered with blood. We stood greatly amazed, and gave the island the name Ileta de Sacrificios, the Island of Sacrifices. Hernán Cortés also writes extensively about the practices of sacrifice that he witnessed. He wrote as following in his journals. They have a most horrid and abominable custom, which truly ought to be punished, and which until now we have seen in no part, and this is that whenever they wish to ask something of the idols, in order that their plea may find more acceptance, they take many boys and girls, and even adults, and in the presence of these idols they open their chests while they are still alive, take out their hearts and entrails, and burn them before the idols, offering the smoke a sacrifice. Some of us have seen this, and they said it is the most terrible and frightful thing that they have ever witnessed. We also have another account from an anonymous conquistador, and it goes as following. They lead them up to the temple, where they dance and carry on joyously, and the man about to be sacrificed dances and carries on like the rest. At length the man who offers the sacrifice strips him naked, and leads him at once to the stairway of the tower where is the stone idol. Here they stretch him on his back, tying the hands to the sides and fastening the legs. Soon comes the sacrificing priest, and this is no small office among them, armed with some stone knife which cuts like steel, and is as big as one of our large knives. He plunges the knife into the chest, opens it, and tears out the heart, hot and palpitating. And this is quickly as one might cross himself, at this point the chief priest of the temple takes it, 
and anoints the mouth of the principal idol with the blood. Then, filling his hand with it, he flings it towards the sun, or towards some star if it be night. Then he anoints the mouths of all the other idols of wood and stone, and sprinkles blood on the corners of the chapel of the principal idol. Afterwards they burn the heart, preserving the ashes as a great relic, and likewise they burn the body of the sacrifice, but these ashes are kept apart from those of the heart in a different vase. The debate over the ecological motivations behind Aztec human sacrifices is one that is highly nuanced. Of course, different anthropologists and historians offer their own contrasting and sometimes contradicting theories. One anthropologist, Michael Harner, suggests that the primary driver for the Aztec practice of cannibalism was a nutritional deficiency in their diet, specifically a lack of sufficient protein. According to him, the Aztecs faced high population pressures and relied heavily on maize agriculture, which of course did not provide essential amino acids. Thus, with limited access to large game due to increasing population and competition with other carnivores, Hanner suggests that human sacrifice and the subsequent cannibalism of war captives became a grim solution to this problem. Marvin Harris, Harris rather, supports this viewpoint in his work Cannibals and Kings suggesting that human flesh was considered an elite food, consumed as a reward by the aristocracy to supplement a protein-deficient diet. This theory proposes that the ecological pressures of a densely populated agricultural society, lacking domesticated animals for meat, led to ritualistic cannibalism. But conversely, there are those who challenge these claims, criticizing the foundation of Hanner's argument and questioning the reliability of his sources. Ortiz de Montelano points out that the Aztec diet included a variety of protein sources, such as salamanders, fowl, armadillos, and even weasels, which were abundant in and around Lake Texcoco the Aztec's homeland. Moreover, he highlights that amaranth, a plant integral to the Aztec diet, was rich in both leaves and seeds that provided the necessary protein. Now, Ortiz de Montelano further argues that the Aztec's advanced agricultural techniques, such as chinampas or floating gardens, along with a tribute system, did well enough to ensure a good surplus of food resources, which of course contradicts this notion of a protein crisis. He also criticizes Hanna's dependence on historical sources from Spanish conquerors, which he believes could have been biased to justify certain colonial aspects by depicting Aztec society as barbaric and negative. Now, the whole system of sacrifice in Aztec culture was of course so intertwined that it had become a completely normal thing. No one had really battered an eyelid at the daily spectacle. It had simply been going on for so long. And it was not only a spiritual duty, but evolved into this grand theatrical performance that involved the entire community. Thus it was far from the mere killing of war captives or criminals, but it was a ritualized expression of cosmological beliefs, meticulously designed to maintain cosmic order and communicate with the gods. Thus victims were not merely individuals. They were transformed into what the Aztecs called Tixipla, representatives or embodiments of gods, taking on the divine persona through elaborate ceremonial dress and behavior. 
During the numerous Aztec festivals, these chosen individuals, often warriors captured in battle or slaves bought specifically for this purpose, were adorned with the attributes of specific deities, dressed up the best way they could do it. This transformation was both physical and symbolic. It involved costumes, masks, and even the enactment of mythical narratives associated with the gods. This process, of course, culminated in the crescendo of ritualistic death, which was believed to nourish the gods, just like feeding a bird. Now this concept of netio to quilizzi, which, sorry about my Aztec pronunciation, we didn't learn that in school, but the rough translation is the desire to be regarded as a god, highlights the profound sense of honor and duty that was associated with being chosen as a sacrifice. Now far from being seen as merely victims, these individuals were revered and honored. Their presence was celebrated with dances, music, and public adoration. Thus, in the year leading up to their sacrifice, they were treated as living deities, a temporary but awe-inspiring status that elevated them above their earthly existence. Diego Duran's historical accounts provide vivid descriptions of how these sacrifice rituals permeated Aztec culture. The use of a victim's skin, particularly in the festival of Shipe Tokek, or Our Lord the Flayed One, exemplifies the deep symbolic connection between the sacrificial act and agricultural fertility. The person who donned the flayed skin was believed to acquire divine attributes, a transformation that showed the profound interplay between death, renewal, and the sustenance of life. And such rituals underscored the Aztec belief in the cyclical nature of life and death, where human sacrifice was seen as a vital conduit, completely necessary act to ensure their ongoing life. Thus the remains of the sacrificed, whether bones, skulls, or skin, were treated with great reverence and respect, considered powerful relics that held ongoing religious significance. At the apex of Aztec society was the Tlatoani, the emperor, who held absolute power and was considered semi-divine. Below him were the nobles, the Pipiltin, who managed the lands and were closely tied to the royal family through blood or marriage. Warriors held a special place in this hierarchy. Their ability to capture enemies destined for sacrifice directly influenced their social standing and potential for upward mobility. This unique aspect of Aztec culture made the role of the warrior pivotal, as success in battle was one of the few ways individuals could achieve greater status and recognition. The importance of bravery and honor in the context of sacrifice was paramount. Those chosen were simply expected to joyously embrace their fate with courage and dignity. If a captive showed fear or reluctance, it reflected poorly on their character and status, and they were subjected to a dishonorable death. This not only affected their legacy, but also their supposed journey in the afterlife. Aztec beliefs held that those who died honorably in sacrifice or battle ascended to a higher form of heaven, whereas those who died less noble deaths faced a more perilous and demeaning afterlife. Well, I would like to thank you for joining me today. That's just about all we have to say about human sacrifice. Of course, it all came to an end, but 
the Empire had to come crashing down eventually. Well, I suppose that is a topic that needs its own video. Thank you to my top tier patrons, Brit, Charles, Stark Factory, JC, Jeffrey, Wendy, Tim, and James. And thank you for watching all this way. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I will see you in the next video. Good night, everyone.